shoulders to look convincing on display, we are putting on some replacement buttons that are quite obviously not an attempt to replace originals in the same way that the fabric is not an attempt to replace what would have been there. We picked a very neutral button that would be very passive and not try and fool anybody. It's obviously modern and um, it would go on here just to fill it in because when the uniforms were worn they probably had their buttons. Separating Jews from society was accomplished through the mandatory humiliation of cloth badges. There have been days when we've come in here, we've wept to see these things, to realize what the experience of the clothing was in terms of the bearer, the person who wore it, that we don't know. But you could you could visualize by the condition of some of these things that we've handled, the heartbreak that these people endured and the suffering. You wonder about the people and how they put such care into their, into their um, clothes and to see it now being in a museum as to that this is something that somebody wore that was probably did not survive. What mm. about the uh, child's nightgown we found that was cut from the mother's or an adult's and we found out that this child survived. What a day that was for us. It really was a high. In fact there are many small victories epiphanies of human goodness associated with the Holocaust, stories of incredible sacrifice and risk on the part of others. Like the Danish mariners who ferried Jews to Sweden. 7,000, more than 90% of Denmark's Jews and hundreds of non-Jewish families reached safety aboard this sort of frail boat. Again and again, this boat and others like it flitted across the Orison Straits into the teeth of the German shore patrol. You can still see it in the moonlight, stark, silent passengers snaking down toward the seashore, babies drugged to stop them crying. This was an option for a lucky few, an exit out of insanity. This launch symbolizes the fearlessness of people willing to risk all to open doors that craven politicians and governments had silently shut. This was the last of the large artifacts to be placed in the museum. From now on, it would be a race to finish on time, to do justice to the history being installed. This is the installation of signs and symbols where sewer is not just a sewer, it's hope, escape. Where barracks were originally for horses, horse stables transform into squalid, if temporary, shelter for humans. Near the barracks is another sort of artifact, a scale model of the routine at Auschwitz, especially what went on in and around the gas chambers. Mieczysław Stobirski was there when the Allies interrogated the Nazi guards. 
He also talked to many former inmates. Then he was asked to build his model. The sculpture of the buildings worked, but he realized he had to populate it. People had to be modeled as well. Stobierski's sculpture has been exhibited at Auschwitz for 40 years now and is regarded not as art, but as an eyewitness account, an artifact. He and his son are building another for Washington. Museums sometimes depend too much on the inorganic, on things. What was needed for balance here was something spiritual, it was people. Jaffa Eliach is a survivor now living in New York. Jaffa was born in a small Polish town, the shtetl of Eshishke, where 3,500 Jews had been a vital part of the community since the Middle Ages. And this was taken in Titianze, in our summer place, uh. and the Germans were coming in. So my grandma grabbed the camera and took the photos. I was feeding the chickens. Little did we know that this would be her last photo. And uh, for me, it was my last photo as a free person. Mm -hmm. It was, in a way, like from the fields of buttercups right. to the killing fields in a matter of a number of days. For years, Jaffa had been combing the world for snapshots of Eshishke, reconstituting re-imaging the people of her youth. The museum needed Jaffa's pictures, a way of putting a human face on impersonal horror. These were neighbors, lovers, far more than faces. The Germans announced that they are giving permission to all the Jews to go to the synagogue and I was sent to my nanny, and my brother was sent to another Polish friend. I was dressed already in my holiday clothes. It was a velvet uh, blue dress with a little lace collar and lace stockings and, uh, and patent leather shoes. Little did my parents uh, know that this was not the best clothing to survive the entire Holocaust. That night, we met my father, who told us the story that they killed all the Jews. He told us he jumped from through the window of the synagogue and then they marched the Jews, first the men to the old cemetery, then the women to the new cemetery, to next to the Christian cemetery. They lined them up and they shot everybody. 29 out of 3,500 Eishishke Jews survived the Rosh Hashanah of 1941. Cindy Miller is the museum designer who worked with Jaffa from the start and is now charged with finding the best way to use her pictures. I was not prepared for the emotional and intellectual and social and ideological diversity that was, was present in the town. It was an entire portrait of a evolving modern society, which is not the portrait one necessarily had typically of a shtetl in Eastern Europe. Displaying the photos is difficult, calling for wit and technical sophistication. And the pictures are shown just as they were taken, neither cropped nor prettified. Out of focus, but alive. The effect of seeing these photographs is to realize what was lost. These photographs that Jaffa has were taken by the people themselves as they wished to be seen, as they wished to be understood, as they saw themselves. Here Jaffa's friends and neighbors live again in a sort of belated, ironic immortality. 
Visitors will constantly pass through and among these faces as they make their way from exhibit to exhibit, floor to floor, cradle to grave. Oral history is the last piece of the puzzle. Compelling evidence that will give our times a special hold on the future that no previous century has had. Survivors' memories are crucial, but the youngest Holocaust survivors are now in their 50s. The youngest with any appreciable images are in their 60s. It's a resource that's literally dying out. The museum has mounted a massive taping effort to save as much as it can. They were not allowed to play with me any longer. I remember that. It's painful. Many survivors have resolutely refused to talk about it until now. I was not allowed to sit in the class with the rest of the students. I had to sit in the back. The first memory of camp is sitting in a chair and having my hair shaved. And I recall the hair falling in my face, mingling with my tears. And then a uniform being thrown at me and a pair of clogs and pushed outside. I recall walking outside and seeing all of these hundreds and hundreds of other women with their heads shaved, some holding on to their uniforms and some wearing their uniforms already. And here was Fritzy, this pampered child, thrown into a snake pit, so to speak. When we came out from the showers, the sky was red. The air was filled with smoke and the odor of burning flesh in, in, in hair. A man went over to those officials. It's a man. And he, he asked one of those officials, we called him the Kapos. He asked him about his wife and his little girl. And the man looked him straight in the eyes. He said, there is no more little girl. There was. There was, there's no more wife. He said, what do you mean? Where they are? And he pointed to the chimney with the, that smoke bursting out. This is their funeral. Here they go. All of a sudden, 